technologies by themselves may not be the most efficient or cost-effective approach to solving this problem, but uh, reducing the volume of PFAS and then destroying or fixing that smaller volume before disposal may be a uh, much more elegant and official, uh, efficient answer to a problem. But it's also critical to have an overview of knowledge of some PFAS basics. So it's typically, as we can see here, a chain of carbon atoms that are populated by fluorine. And there's a head and, um, of a carboxylate or a sulfonate typically, and then a chain of um, carbon atoms. Uh, typically, with a number of carbon atoms, uh, typically eight or more are considered long chain. And there's typically uh, PFOA and PFOS are the eight chain, eight carbon chains, and six or fewer are the short chains. So it's our experience that the longer chain PFOS are easier to remove than short chain. Um, and the longer chain are also considered more toxic typically than the short chain. Um, but in many technologies, some of the long chain may be converted to short chain PFOS. So looking at the structure, you see the head um, can be either typically carboxylate or a sulfonate. In our experience, in many of these technologies, the sulfonates are more easily removed or destroyed than the carboxylates. So we found it's important to perform bench and pilot scale studies to really confirm a technology. We found and decided to uh, separate these technologies into those that are field implemented, those that have limited application, and those that are developing either in laboratory or bench scale without any field demonstration. So looking at some of these technologies that we'll discuss, I separated them into absorptive technologies and physical technologies, both those of segregation compared to destructive technologies. So in color coding here, the black are the typical uh, technologies that are uh, pretty well used in the field. Those in blue are sort of limited technologies that are uh, being developed or uh, pilot scale. And uh, those in red are, are really the developing ones. And they, there's quite a few of those, those technologies. So very typically, we see some different approaches for groundwater compared to leachate. Um, and the stronger ones of uh, residuals and, and, and soils or sludges that may have some higher concentrations. So there's, there's different approaches for each. So some of the current technologies that we see for um, typically for drinking water or groundwater um, and somewhat for landfill leachate, maybe, maybe activated carbon, um, ion exchange resin, uh, reverse osmosis, or deep well injection that makes, basically makes things go away. So here's an example in the lower uh, left, you'll see some reverse osmosis um, modules. Uh, the other two are activated carbon or ion exchange. So with granular activated carbon, which usually by itself is not a good answer for landfill leachate because that gets used up very, very quickly and it gets expended uh, this will typically have an empty bed contact time of, say, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, typically, that uh, has very short bed life for landfill leachate, but uh, it could be used as a polishing technique for some of these other technologies. Uh, typically, you'll see those systems in a lead and lag uh, approach where you have a primary cylinder followed by a secondary polishing unit when the first cylinder gets expended uh, that uh, switch from the, the lag to become the lead and then the other cylinder that previously was the lead cylinder can be um, removed and, and uh, the contents regenerated. Um, the activated carbon can be reactivated in a furnace um, and uh, that or incinerated and those uh, products can be reused. But I can I call this a, a blunt hammer approach because it removes virtually um, all the PFAS, the VOCs, or, or organics. And we find that it's better for long chain than short chain uh, as uh, if the, uh, the, the adsorption sites are used up, sometimes the longer chain uh, PFAS constituents can knock off the shorter chain ones and we see shorter chain being um, in the effluent. But it is it's a good approach for um, relatively low contamination of groundwater sites. Um, here's, a, here's a site, we have an extraction well, 
going through uh, filtration and then carbon uh, columns, and then can be either re-injected into the groundwater or uh, direct discharge. And as I mentioned before, um, ion exchange is another technology. Typically, these have a shorter uh, contact time, so it means smaller vessels. Uh, the media itself is more expensive typically than, than granular activated carbon. But we see that uh, the carboxylates, the ones that end in A, are much more difficult to remove than the sulfonates that end in, uh, typically in S. Um, and you generally look, for example, an ion exchange may end up with uh, several hundred thousand um, bed volumes before it has to be regenerated in a single uh, single use um, expended ion exchange media can be uh, solidified and, and uh, I'm supposed to landfill or incinerated. Um, if it's a regenerated media, it can go through a regeneration process and be reused. <clears throat> so very typically you'll see some um, groundwater that's being um, treated. It can go through some, some uh, solids removal or some clarification first before it goes to uh, a lead and leg ion exchange vessel. Reverse osmosis is a very well used uh, technology for contaminant groundwater and we're using a number of uh, landfill leachate sites we're designing. Um, this is a membrane separation device. It removes virtually all long and short chain uh, PFAS constituents, as well as uh, VOCs and, and, uh, and other contaminants. But you'll, you'll find uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, of the water comes out as permeate, um, and you'll have somewhere as 10, 15, 20 percent of the flow as a reject that would have to be uh, managed. But what do you do with that? Um, those other constituents that come out in the reject, um, some places have recirculated those to the landfill where it's uh, acceptable in a solid waste environment. Uh, they can be solidified. Um, Lafarge Holson Concrete um, Cement Company has technology with the modified cement that they're using to, uh, to stabilize and solidify the material. Uh, it can be evaporated um, or can be other technologies mentioned, electro-oxidation, plasma, or some other technologies for uh, managing those residuals. In areas where uh, the geology is acceptable. Uh, steep well injection has been practiced. Uh, a number of landfills in, in Michigan have that right now. Uh, it requires a significant amount of pressure uh, in order of uh, 1500 PSI. You have to have some uh, filtration because you don't want to block the geologic environment, as well as uh, some chemical reduction has to take place because, uh, for example, barium sulfate is going to precipitate it somewhere around five milligrams per liter. So you have to be uh, aware of the chemistry because you don't want um, solids that are formed uh, within the uh, material that's disposed of to block the uh, geologic formation. In addition, uh, before uh, site is approved, uh, typically the permitting time period may be five years or more. Another technology we've looked at is electrocoagulation. Um, this is a process uh, that can help uh, remove and destroy um, PFAS constituents. It requires a lot of pretreatment because uh, without pretreatment, there's going to be a lot of foaming. So the, uh, the alkalinity has to be removed either biologically or, or stripped out. And the residual is a smaller amount. Uh, one company we've been speaking with is uh, HTX down in Texas, and they have a patented technology. Um, they also approach this as, um, as a service where they will actually put in a system and uh, charge uh, a, per, a cents per gallon uh, fee. Uh, so there's very little capital uh, initially expended. Another technology is ozofractionation. Uh, since a lot of the PFAS are surfactant, have surfactant qualities, uh, they can actually uh, foam off. So with an injection of um, of some air, whether it's uh, air or ozone, um, can separate the, the PFAS constituents and they can be managed separately. These uh, extract uh, virtually a large portion of the PFAS constituents, um, then the, uh, the foam can be managed separately. We'll discuss that in one of the case examples I'm going to show in a little bit. 
there's a number of adsorbents that have proved effective for both ex situ and in situ technologies for uh, managing and, and, uh, and, and uh, removing PFAS. Um, we've been working with a modified bentonite from a company called Fluorosor. Uh, the product is called Fluorosor from Setco, and uh, that has the ability to, to preferentially adsorb PFAS constituents. There's a number of other uh, manufacturers that make other products, uh, either a modified activated carbon or a modified um, uh, inorganic material that's coated. Uh, these have the ability to um, selectively remove uh, constituents in a relatively low concentration of groundwater. Uh, they, are, they are pretty effective for um, leachate. They have to have typically some form of pretreatment to avoid the fouling of these media. But here's some sort of what it looks like with fluorosaur, first granular activated carbon. A hardwood biochar has been used not nearly as effectively in ion exchange. So that's typically what they, they look like. The modified bentonite has some uh, really strong ability, um, much more so even than granular activated carbon in, um, in the groundwater environment. Um, is on the upper right, you'll see something compared to the um, health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion of PFOA and PFOS uh, has a, a longer bed life than, than granular activated carbon. Um, and they'll have somewhat similar capability compared to ion exchange that has typically a much longer bed life also than in granular activated carbon. On the lower right, we took a look at the ability for uh, fluorosorb, the uh, modified bentonite, to remove uh, PFAS constituents. Um, comparing uh, just a plain filtered, uh, mechanically filtered landfill leachate with biologically treated leachate, you'll see there's a significant difference um, that uh, the PFAS uh, has been able to uh, be absorbed, absorbed um, on this material. Another technology that EPA is looking at um, is supercritical water oxidation above 705 degrees Fahrenheit and 32 PSI. Uh, we see a point that you rapidly destroy PFAS constituents. Um, this is a technology that's, uh, that's being investigated. There is actually a company in, in, uh, in Sweden that manufactures um, a containerized system. There's a significant amount of organics. No additional fuel is needed to keep those uh, conditions. And tests have, have, uh, have shown they can have significant reductions in, uh, in the PFAS constituents. Uh, Patel is actually looking at building a 3,500-gallon-per-day trailer for this. Another technology is, uh, is plasma. Um, there's a couple of different approaches for that. Uh, one actually uh, bubbles a, a gas, either uh, an argon or ozone, through, uh, through a liquid where uh, we have a plasma at the surface and it will destroy the, the PFAS foam. Um, in this technology, uh, you have a uh, ability to produce um, the reduction of, of longer chain PFAS, much more so than the shorter chain PFAS. For example, we see um, site that's being uh, looked at at the, at the Navy, where you have um, large uh, reduction in PFAS constituents. But if you notice, um, the, lo the longer chain PFAS is more easily removed than, than the shorter chain PFAS. And the uh, carboxylates, the ones down to the bottom, have a lower percentage of removals, yet uh, does have a great ability to remove the PFAS constituents. The other company makes a slightly different PFAS technology where they have a cyclonic flow of water with um, a plasma uh, flame uh, towards the middle of that, so you have a, a, a as much contact pos as possible between the plasma and, the, and the, uh, the liquid that's being treated, and they have some significant reductions in that as well. What we find is that there's a sequential breakdown um, in the plasma operation from the PFAS to the PFOA, and a sequential uh, degradation of the carbons as they're being chewed off. Um, that the longer chain carbons are more easily removed. The, the longer chain carbons can degrade. Um, to the smaller ones, but the smaller chain carbons, uh, PFAS generally have a much uh, much longer retention life um, than the, the 
one or two months. It's also possible to uh, produce um, an in-situ groundwater treatment for PFAS um, without, uh, without removal of the groundwater. And this is, occurs through uh, injection of material that actually uh, adsorbs uh, PFAS constituents in the ground. Um, there's a, a colloidal granular activated carbon that can be injected in uh, to a groundwater treatment system uh, that has some significant ability to remove the PFAS. Um, here on the right, you'll see some chain of uh, PFAS uh, at several groundwater sites in Michigan that, that uh, significantly remove uh, the PFAS constituents uh, in an in situ environment. So, the residuals that we talked about from some of the technologies um, really have to have some additional treatment. Uh, the residuals from some of the liquid processes can be either incinerated uh, with supercritical uh, water oxidation, uh, electrochemical oxidation that we just heard about earlier, uh, plasma, or disposed of in a hazardous waste landfill. The absorptive medias, um, when they are completely uh, populated, um, there's a cement cementitious uh, stabilization and solidification approach. Um, a wholesome uh, uh, cement company has been uh, proposing to use some of that as alternate daily cover on landfills. Uh, it's incinerated or disposed of in a hazardous waste landfill. EPA is looking at uh, some other approaches. One is a, mecha a mechanical chemical treatment, sort of a milling operation that they use in mining with um, some additional um, co-milling agents, uh, just the high pressure of the, of the milling can actually destroy uh, some of the PFAS constituents. We've been working with uh, Dan Cassidy of the University of Western Michigan on the uh, stabilization of some of the materials. Um, in the floor sorb, uh, PFAS removal of the liquid flow, uh, when that gets completely used up, you have to do something with it. So we've been looking at solidification um, with uh, between two and six percent uh, weight by weight of a cementitious product uh, to get down below um, DCLP uh, constituent level. Of, uh, we look at 70 parts per trillion as, as a level for PFOA, PFOS in uh, an expended um, uh, or sort of material that modified bentonite. And that has the great ability uh, to be um, to be solidified to prevent the uh, bleaching of the PFAS constituents. Well, uh, another approach in, in the ground is looking at stabilization at a number of sites. Uh, EPA has been looking at a comparison of, of several different adsorbents uh, to be uh, milled into the into a contaminated site for uh, preventing of uh, a further. Uh, dissolution of the PFAS constituents into the groundwater. So this is an approach that's currently being used uh, at some other sites. Lafarge Wholesome, as we mentioned before, it does have a proprietary cement binder uh, that can prevent uh, liquids uh, that are contained with, uh, that have high concentrations of, of PFAS from being, uh, being uh, flow coming out of them. It looks like it can be again friable to be used as a daily cover at landfills. It has a very low amount of uh, PFAS that uh, passes the uh, um, SL, SPLP um, flow test. So let's take a look at a couple of case studies. The first is um, uh, foam fractionation for contaminated groundwater. Uh, this is a containerized system in a site in, uh, in Australia at an uh, Australian Air Force Base has been in operation uh, for over a year. And what they find is they have some significant uh, ability to remove the PFAS constituents by foam fractionation of the, uh, the longer chain uh, compounds, uh, the shorter chain compounds, and some of the precursors are not nearly as, as well removed, but it uh, did pass the ability uh, for the, the project requirements. And in this case, they do have a pre-filtration, um, and then they have uh, primary foam fractionation. Uh, the residuals of the foam uh, then are passed in through two different uh, foam fractionation processes. 
that have uh, foam reduction by, by the vacuum process, and they have um, significantly less than, than a tenth of a percent of volume uh, of the uh, reject compared to uh, the material that, that, that comes in. And um, they do have a, a resin or a bit of carbon as a polishing step uh, to have virtually PFAS free uh, water coming out. KSU is another foam fractionation system in the Tele, uh, Togi landfill uh, that's right outside Stockholm, Sweden. In a 40 foot container for over two years, they've been um, using this to treat um, uh, landfill leachate. Uh, what they find is that there's very little pretreatment involved. Uh, it's just some suspended solids removal by filtration, and they can uh, obtain a single part per trillion of the modified of the uh, sample PFAS constituents. Uh, here we have a significant reduction in their uh, the PFAS constituents. The uh, ones that are uh, regulated have uh, virtually uh, 95, 98 percent removals. Some of the uh, shorter chain have much lower percentage removals. Uh, the important part here is they found that uh, they have much less than, than a cent equivalent of a cent per gallon um, treatment cost, which is uh, significantly cost effective compared to some of the other technologies. Oh, Orchard Hills Landfill has a reverse osmosis system. Um, here they, uh, uh, they had a, a plant improvement. Uh, the original system had a 25,000 gallon per day gas evaporator. Uh, they replaced that with the 80,000 gallon per day um, row chem reverse osmosis unit. The residuals are returned to the landfill and they have some significant uh, removal results. Uh, here they had virtually uh, all of the PFAS constituents down to uh, low single digits. And uh, the system has been in operation for several years now. Another case study is, uh, uh, this is a, um, in, uh, British Columbia. This is a, a regional airport and uh, a Canadian Air Force base that had a fire training area. And here they had an excavation of the soils uh, in a project area because they need to do some replacements. And what they found was there's uh, areas of low and high uh, soil concentration of PFAS from firefighting foam. Uh, part of the project was to stabilize uh, the site so that it reduced the amount of PFAS constituents going to the groundwater. So they looked at a, a number of technologies and what they found was most appropriate is they wanted to uh, remove and, uh, and thermally destroy the high concentration, the lower concentration. Um, they, uh, they set the project requirements to use either uh, the fluorosorb, the modified bentonite at 1% dosage rate, or the rembine, which is a um, modified activated carbon uh, material at a 4% uh, weight. And they found that each means of those two technologies was virtually equivalent. Uh, this project was bid on March 2nd this year. It, it has not yet been, uh, been awarded, but there's some of the uh, volumes of materials for, for removal of the contaminated soil for destruction. The estimated was uh, 12,500 tons. And the uh, stabilized material that is going to be mixed and, and stabilized on site with those constituents um, was uh, 15,000 tons. Fifth case study is supercritical water oxidation. Uh, this is a um, process that uh, is marketed by a, a company in Sweden. Uh, it's been tested on landfill leachate, um, airport, uh, AAA, uh, AFFF foam. Um, and another waste site in, in Norway. And what they found with the supercritical water oxidation, they were able in, in a single pass to uh, significantly remove a combination of PFAS constituents. So the point here is that we've seen that there's a tremendous number of technologies and a lot of players in that. We try to make some sense out of these. Um, and here you see what the absorption technologies are uh, some of the, the players in the ion exchange, some other technologies in oxidation reduction, and some other uh, technologies, for example, including um, 
plasma, earthworms, um, just a range of technologies. So we're trying to make some sense out of that. So we put together a chart basically looking at the stages of development of some of these technologies with a range of practicality. You see in the upper right, uh, reverse osmosis, activated carbon ion exchange. Uh, those are all very well accepted technologies. Uh, and some of the um, laboratory or innovative technologies that are grouped down towards the, the lower right, the lower left. So there's just a range. And we said, you know, well, what can be uh, considered for, um, for treatment? So on the left-hand column, I looked at what some of the contaminants are that may typically be seen in, uh, in landfill leachate and the different technologies that would be appropriate for them. Biological treatment is um, being investigated, but typically is, is not um, capable of removing PFAS um, compared to activated carbon ion exchange, reverse osmosis, um, chemical oxidation, electrooxidation, uh, advanced um, oxidation processes, plasma, or some of the absorbent technologies. So we just sort of generalized um, what technologies would be appropriate for which constituents. So here's some of the, the takeaways. We see the oxalates, uh, carboxylates are, are harder to remove than sulfonates. The longer chain are easier to remove uh, or destroy than some of the shorter chain. But it's also important to consider uh, that these may be building blocks for a complete system that each one of these technologies we mentioned may not be appropriate by themselves. They typically are energy intensive. Um, many of these technologies have limited field scale examples. Uh, and there's a lot of um, investigation that's needed to compare life cycle costs. It's really at the, at the front end of, of a lot of these technologies. Well, that's the basis of what I wanted to talk about today. And uh, if there's any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Great. Well, thank you for that overview. That puts a lot of information in, in um, some, some context for us. So um, with landfill leachate, what sort of uh, concentrations are you looking at when you were thinking about these technologies? Uh, that's a good question because it depends where you look at. For example, in the U.S., you see somewhere, um, if you look at um, combined uh, uh, analyses, uh, that's going to be somewhere you know, on the 24 to 36 parameters, maybe somewhere as uh, 1,000 to 3,000 uh, parts per trillion. Uh, overseas, you're going to see maybe an order of magnitude higher in some other company, countries, for example, like China or India, would have 30 to 50,000 uh, parts per trillion. So uh, some of the, this is significant range of, um, of what those, those uh, PFAS constituents are. It depends if it's an ash landfill, uh, municipal solid waste landfill, a C and D construction demolition landfill, uh, whether it's one in the northern climate, southern climate, wet environment, dry environment. Uh, so there's a range that we see, but uh, a typical number in the U.S. may be a thousand to three thousand parts per trillion. Okay, and how about um, two factors that everybody's, of course, interested in, which is energy consumption. Um, you know, because of the change and all those things, but also money. So energy and money um, comparisons <laughs> with, with the technology. Yeah, anything that they say is going to be a very, um, very generalized approach. We're looking very closely at, uh, at some of the modified bentonite as being a real strong uh, contender for a low cost approach. Uh, the material is, uh, is fairly low cost. You're looking at a couple of dollars per pound. Um, and what you look at in a comparison for that is, is the, um, for example, the uh, microgram per gram of, of absorption capacity. Activated carbon is going to be uh, fairly expensive unless it's used as a polishing compound. Uh, reverse osmosis may have um, some slightly higher cost, but then you have to compare what the cost is for the technology and the cost of, of what residuals management are. Um, nothing is frankly cheap. On the overall basis, you're going to look at, uh, for example, landfill leachate, um, two to five cents per gallon. 
uh, for operation maintenance and, and capitalization costs over say a 20 year life cycle. Okay, um, and some of those construction technologies obviously um, more. Um, so I will ask you one more question and then I might bring it back to uh, Shang Tao and Rebecca as well, which is um, out AFFF, you know, lots of states would like collecting AFFF, the old stuff, get it out of the system, but then there's the question of what to do with that. So um, some folks are very interested in in this idea of um, stabilization and, and um, you know, maybe making it um, sequestered. So what um, what what do you think about that, and what what are what are feasible things to do with um, AFFF? Right. Well, if we trade from the groundwater, I think is something that can be managed as some of the technologies we mentioned. It, it, it's um, the uh, unused AFFF that's fairly high concentration that poses another set of problems. You know, we've been looking at incineration as one technology, but that's been running into a lot of problems lately, not only um, with potential emissions, but also public reaction. So that's in the short term until um, technologies are, are gonna be improved and proven, um, that's probably not a feasible answer. Um, solidification, stabilization, and placing a landfill, uh, maybe uh, a, a better approach with some of those more concentrated wastes uh, the electro-oxidation, supercritical water oxidation uh, for some of the, the uh, uh, more concentrated materials may be, may be a relatively good answer. So for the state, the solidification and stabilization technologies, is there a long-term track record? Are people confident that, that this stuff is sequestered? <laughs> Um, in, in any approach, it's really important to do a bench scale followed by a, by a pallet scale, really to confirm the, the capability. Um, landfills themselves have a very strong ability to sequester, uh, sequester those constituents when placed in there. So if it's stabilized uh, and solidified, and we see that there's very low concentrations coming out of that material, and then it's placed in the landfill, I think that's a really um, societal benefit uh, and a good place to place those materials. Okay, great. Um, so I think there's still. So going back to um, let's see. Somebody was wondering. <laughs> I I don't know if you misspoke or um, or, but a couple people pointed out back when you were talking about plasma, there was some some mention that PFOS, P-F-O-S, can degrade into P-F-O-A? Is, is that a mistake? <laughs> um, that's actually what um, one of the tests has, has shown. A uh, company is uh, on vector that's doing that uh, material approach for the cyclonic uh, plasma approach. And that's what actually they reported. Um, I had a question about that as well, and I just presented what uh, what the company reported without uh, independent confirmation. But um, yeah, I could understand that that question, but again, that's what has been reported. Well, I wonder if there were precursors or something, and that was what created the PFOA, not necessarily the PFOS turning into it. I don't know. That's okay. So was there a reference? <laughs> Yeah. Um, that people can look at? Um, they can go into the, uh, that company's website. It's shown there. Okay. So, and, um, and, you know, you very may be correct that uh, we do see a lot of um, the precursors in, the, for example, biological treatment are uh, converted into some of the right, more regulated PFAS constituents. So it actually may come from a precursor. Um, however, that uh, Again, this is what this company has shown. Okay. So the slides will be available eventually. Uh, it usually takes a few days on the NMO website. I will send an email when they are ready so then people can can um, look at these slides and, and, and contact the 
or look at the company uh, directly to, to verify that, but a couple people did point out. Um, so, um, so now I think I'm going to switch back to um, Rebecca and Shang Tao and just ask the same similar question. Well, one, we didn't get into cost in your and energy use. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, and then also this whole, um, yeah, what to do about AFFF and, and landfill leachate, um, which can be a variable, you know, over time, not always a uh, thing to treat. So can you talk maybe a little bit about about that in, in relation to your technology? Sure, I can I can start Cheng Tao and you can fill in any any additional comments. That sounds good. Um, so I, as you can expect, cost and energy are are questions we get a lot for our technology, and we are in the process of evaluating that. We do have you know the one uh, small scale pilot at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, but looking at cost and energy usage is going to be a primary focus of the large scale demonstration systems that we showed the photos of um, because those are a lot more representative of what would be applied you know full scale situation so I would say the you know we're still collecting that information um, there has been some published data on energy consumption for electrochemical treatment of PFAS and that has shown um, a range of 30 to 300 watt hours per liter of water treated. Um, so that was published by others, but a similar, you know, electrochemical oxidation technology. As far as uh, AFFF concentrate, um, that is something that we are, you know, looking at treating with the, uh, the standalone technology application of um, Defloro. And actually the Australian pilot is going to start off by treating um, spent AFFF. Um, but, but then depending on how that goes, we are going to also treat AFFF concentrate with that system. Um, and, you know, again, we've looked at AFFF concentrate in the past with electrochemical oxidation um, a little bit and looking at, um, you know, the necessity of longer treatment time frames. Um, but we haven't, you know, fully optimized that, but we're hoping to get a chance to do that in the field with the larger, more efficient system. Um, you know, other, other things are like, like what Ivan already mentioned, you know, off-site incineration, um, or other, you know, destructive technologies are things that can be looked at for that. But if anybody's interested in, you know, us, you know, if they're kind of accumulating AFFF concentrate in a, you know, central location and, and have a decent volume that needs to be dealt with, um, you know, I would suggest giving us a call and seeing if it makes sense to, uh, uh, throw that hat in the ring for one of the U.S. pilots for the system. Okay, and then um, how about landfill leachate? What do you think about that? Well, we've worked with um, a couple different landfill leachate clients. Um, you know, like Ivan mentioned, you know, RO is is something that you know is typically used, um, and we've looked at coupling that process. Um, with destructive technologies to deal with the um, residuals from the RO. So like we refer to it as RO reject. Um, so we, we have tested that for one of our um, leachate clients, you know, looking at a, at a coupled approach and we had good results, but, you know, I think they're also looking at, at other options. Um, so I think, you know, the water quality of leachate is, is really complex. Um, and it can be different, like Ivan was saying, depending on where the landfill is located, what type of waste it has, you know, you're going to need to optimize, you know, what your primary treatment is. But there are, you know, options coming along that can help you deal with the residuals from those primary treatment components. I don't know, Sheng Tao, you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think that's that's great, Rebecca. All right, well, we're just pushing up at 3 o'clock, and I think I've gone through most of the questions, even the ones we got in the beginning. Um, so I think with that, um, like I said, I will just um, 
Oh, here, I can show you where the presentations will be because I think the Namal website is more active now. So you come to the regular website, you pick Wayside Cleanup, then you pick Events. Here's things that are coming up. Um, the furthest thing out in the future is at the top, but we have these two more webinars that will be happening uh, in June on PFAS and then all the past events. So you'll scroll down this uh, destroying PFAS today. It's the split personality. It's, it's in the future and in the past, um, but eventually it will be in this list, you know, going backwards in time. Um, and there's lots of all the webinars we've been doing. The presentations are all posted. Um, like I said, we've, we've done some webinars on other topics like PCBs and vapor intrusion, soil mixing, and some other things. So um, in the past, so we can scroll all the way down. And we had we used to have uh, real in-person workshops, and those, um, you know, are um, are also available the presentations from those. So um, with that, I think we will we will end. So thank you so much to Ivan and Rebecca and Shankau for their uh, lending their expertise and their time today. And thank you to all of you for for attending and and hanging in there. And um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. So with that, thanks again. Bye bye.